the research, the the equipment, you know, the boots. I, I have no idea if these things will make a difference, but I've been wearing male boots since I was six. I've never thought anything of it because that's just the way of the world. I wanted to start my, my questions by taking you back to that pivotal moment two years ago um, when you led the England team to victory at the Euros, achieving something never before seen by an England team. <laughs> Um, and looking back now with everything that you've done in the meantime during your rehab, um, missing the World Cup, writing a book, um, playing with the BBC Concert Orchestra, what is it that stands out um, from that Euros high, if anything, and do you view it differently two years from now? I honestly hope that the feeling that I had that day, I will hold on to forever, um, in terms of the pure sort of... I knew, I knew the weight of what we'd done then. I knew the night before, to be honest, I think that we would have had a significant effect on, on the country, uh, on the world, regardless of the result. But to, in the moment, the first thing I, I felt was relief, which is, I think, a, a little bit sad that there's so much, we put so much pressure on ourselves to achieve something that, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, and when I look back now, I, I don't remember that bit, which I, which I mm. like. Um, but I think being away from the game, having been injured, missing the World Cup, the, if you're in football, the, the train just keeps going and you just have to, you have to stay on it for as long as possible, basically. And all of those girls have then had to go again and go again. And they've gone to a World Cup. Some of my teammates have five days after a World Cup final and losing a World Cup final to return back to their, their day job, so to speak. I didn't have any of that. So to come back into a squad now, I'm still, I'm still living on the Euros. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still riding the high. Um, <laughs> and that's been difficult for me, but I think it's also nice. And I've had conversations with my friends that it's, it's kind of refreshing because to me, that's, that's my last memory. And it, I don't think it's a bad one to have sticking around for a while. No, of course not. And, and speaking, speaking of the Euros, we're of course now going into qualifiers um, for the next competition, and quite a lot's changed since, since the last time, particularly, particularly the squad. Um, so Jill Scott and Anne White have both retired. Now Rachel Daly, who played a vital role in the World Cup, um, she's also retired from international duty. Um, so we've seen a lot of changes as well with, with the captain's position in your absence. So how do you feel as an England player as we go sort of further into the qualifiers um, with a team that has experienced so many changes, what do you think the team is going to be looking to do to, to sort of compensate for that? Yeah, so I think there's a real danger when you've, when you've had success uh, that you, you, you try and keep everything the same because the recipe was perfect. So many things change, you lose, you lose people, you lose personalities. I'm not just talking about them, you know, skill set and the, uh, them and their skill set. I'm talking about what they are and what they bring to a group. I struggled with that coming back in, that you have to accept that things are different and that things will work differently. Uh, and I see now a team that, and I, I've mentioned this before when we went to the World Cup, I think during the Euros, if, if anyone watched. And, <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone okay, watched. Okay. <laughs> We're all aware of us at the, the story. It was brilliant. Literally every single second, we even gave you a bit of drama in the quarterfinals. You thought we were heading out. <laughs> um, you know, we turned it around. You go to a World Cup and it was a very different feel, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and more of a the typical English spirit of like fighting to win and, and doing anything to get over the line. So now you've seen a team that can do both. I'm very excited. Um, and we'll know in a couple of weeks time if that was, you know, uh, misplaced or not, but I, I'm quite excited at what the, the group has to offer because I think it's a bit of an, the unknown. Mm -hmm. However, we still have the same quality, etc. in the squad. So I'm, I encourage everyone to continue watching because I think it'll be a good, <laughs> a good ride this summer. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you say there about, about spirit and I suppose about loyalty. Um, you've stayed loyal to Arsenal for a very long time, your whole career. Um, but of course, there's also some changes to that team as well. Um, recently, and I just wanted to talk a bit more about what we can sort of look forward to um, for the next season. So, for example, just this week, your, your teammate, Vivian 
announced that she would not be renewing her contract. Um, and as the league's top goal scorer, um, how do you think Arsenal's going to adapt to this loss? And can you comment any more on whether she's retiring, she's moving? Or? Yeah, so Viv will be playing next year. Um, and I hope for her, you know, we've been through the same injury. It's, it's a really difficult process. I think until you've done it, I always looked at it and I, I had empathy for whoever went through the experience of an ACL. But you do genuinely have a different perspective when, um, when you've been through it. She's she struggled and she's had some setbacks, so I'm excited for her to to shine again um, because we all know that she can. I'm not looking forward to not playing with her and having to play against her, but <laughs> she knows that anyway. Um, but I think for us, we have to find find a different way now. You know, like when Viv, we won the season, uh, won the league back in 2019, and she was everything. You know, she she provided the goals. She she was the superstar, um, albeit reluctantly. She hates anyone talking about her or, or celebrating her in any way. Um, but yeah, so we, we need to find different ways. We need to find different ways to, to come together. But we have done for the last year, you know, we've been missing key players. So I hope mm. that, again, we're, we're prepared for that. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously, you and her both suffered a similar injury. You yeah. mentioned it. And I sort of wanted to, to, to get your thoughts as well on, on the very recent launch of this new project, the project yeah. ACL, which has just been announced, and whether, what, you, what your views are about how that's going to help progress studies and research around the injury and how we might be able to prevent this happening as much in the future. Yeah, I think I, we all realised this year, um, there's a crazy stat that at the World Cup last year, there was, I'm going to say 37, but don't quote me on it players that would have been at the World Cup had it not been for an ACL injury. So we're just speaking specifically ACL, that's before you bring in muscle tears, etc. That's disgusting. And that's a failure of, of sport um, in general, because even when we started asking the questions originally, there were no answers because there is no research on women. Uh, all the, the research, the the equipment, you know, the boots, I have no idea if these things will make a difference, but I've been wearing male boots since I was six. I've never thought anything of it because that's just the way of the world. Uh, who knows if it could have made a difference. So I think this will be, maybe I won't see the benefits in my lifetime. Uh, it's, it's kind of the same as we, we do a lot of work on menstrual cycles and, and all the, the research involved with that is, is ongoing. I will never see the benefits of that because it's such a big project. And, mm -hmm. uh, but for the future of women's football, I think we're in a really good place and these are really good steps forward to protect the next generation and the generation after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to talk about the culture of, of women, specifically around women's football a little bit later on. But just one more question about, about Arsenal before we go. Um, looking ahead to sort of some of the new additions to the team, um, in the Bristol City match last month, we saw you come off the pitch and give, give way to a, to a younger player, Katie Reid, for her senior Reed, yeah. debut. And I was wondering um, what advice you'd like to give um, to the younger players um, just that are starting to come up? And, and how do you think players like Katie will, will change the game for Arsenal and, and internationally? So I now have the job of keep, keeping Katie at bay for as long as possible <laughs> because she's exceptional and she will take my shirt one day, which I, I hope I've got a couple more years in me to, you know, get used to that idea before it happens. I think if you, you compare the experience of me growing up uh, to Katie's journey and the facilities, the coaches, the, the development of women's football, she should be better than me, which I do tell them. That's my bit of advice, be it good or bad. They should be t 10 times a better footballer than me when they get to 27 because everything's, everything's there for them now. And uh, well, not everything, we're, we're on a journey. Uh, but recently, the advice that I've started to give is I really struggled with 10 and 27. Don't know why. 10 and 26 was fine, but 27 has <laughs> tipped me over the edge. And I think because in my career, that sort of means I'm on now the downhill to the end. Uh, but it goes so fast. And for somebody like Katie, who's grown up at Arsenal, uh, same, same as me, all of our youngsters, they've all been mm -hmm. there a long time. And I don't want them to waste a second because I did. I did waste the first four or five years of my senior career 
putting so much pressure on myself and not being able to deal with the fact that I truly do love Arsenal um, mm. with my own performance and feeling like I constantly owed somebody something. Uh, so I try and tell them to enjoy it, which is a silly thing to say to somebody when they're about to come on and make their senior debut. But um, yeah, trying to make it as fun as possible for them to then just achieve their potential. They're, like I said, they're already, they already have a head start on the rest of us. Yeah. Well, then finally, before we move on and, and, and give the keen audience a chance to ask them some, some questions, I wanted to um, talk about culture, yeah. as I mentioned before, surrounding women's sport and, and sort of women's football. And how it seems that there are definitely still some barriers left that we're yet to cross um, with regards to equality in the space. And you've spoken up before regarding the FA's ban on women's football between 1922 and 71, um, and that it meant your own mum couldn't go pro. Um, and your book, which released last summer, addresses a lot of these issues as well. Um, the most recent World Cup has been significant for women's football in many ways. Even though England didn't win, it felt like something bigger came out of that tournament. The whole world was talking about the kiss that happened during the awards ceremony. Um, it caused mass uproar online and sparked a debate on, on sexism within the FA. The England team stood by, stood by Spain during that protest, but do you think there's still more that can be done to challenge sexism in the FA? I think until the world changes, there will always be problems. I feel like the, the barriers that we face in terms of sexism, um, misogyny in women's football are reflective of the, those issues in society. I think that they are, um, they are so similar. So I think that there will be, this will be ongoing for, for a long time mm. uh, because I think it's a generational thing. That's my honest opinion. And I think until that generation isn't here anymore, we will always face the same question marks, the same, <sighs> why can't you sort of just get on, you know, we've given you this now, take it and be happy. I don't know if anyone's ever heard any of my interviews, but again, it doesn't really sit right with me and I'm, I won't be happy. I don't think I'll ever be happy in my career with what we have. I'll always ask for more and better. Uh, I think we are treated exceptionally well as a national team at the FA and I feel like we have the ear of those that we that we need it mm. from. However, I think these stories will resurface and resurface, like I say, until we really have changed, changed everything because there, there's been a shift after the Euros when I walk down the street, I speak to people that will say to me, you know, they always give you that backhanded comment, compliment of like, oh, I don't watch it, that was great. And I'm like, okay, that's, mm. that's fantastic. But it does, it does change people's perception. I think the more we change society's perception of us then the people at the top can't, mm -hmm. can't oppose that. And I do think that if we, currently we're in a stage where we're quite valuable, it's quite valuable to have women in adverts and equal representation in commercials and on crisp packets and such. But there, there's a long way to go until that that is genuinely believed to mm. be the norm and to be the right thing rather than a tick box, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so that's what I'll continue to fight for. Uh, and I know that my teammates share the same sentiment, but at the FA and the way that we are treated and the way that they listen to the requests that, the, that we have, uh, and I'm not talking here about money or, you know, I'm talking about culture and, and being, we always say that we call ourselves a leading nation, but how are we actually demonstrating that we are? And I'm not talking about being a leading na nation on the pitch, I'm talking about off of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think we have a long way to go, but I think that the, the conversations that are happening, you can't, you can't fix everything in overnight, you know, it's a process. Mm -hmm. But do you think that the leadership on the pitch does make a difference sometimes? I mean, um, for example, uh, FIFA also issued a big debate when they made their decision to, to ban players from wearing the, the One Love armband. Um, and as a captain who, who personally wore the, the rainbow armband during the Euros in support of LGBTQ rights, how did, how did that make you feel when, when FIFA issued the ban? And, and do you think that that is one of those examples of steps in the wrong direction when we should be trying to change the social culture in the other direction? I, I'm trying to word this correctly because 
I've said it before and I quite like the way it came out and I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to repeat the same again. Um, but I think when people ask for equality and that can be, you know, um, women's rights, it can be, you know, across everything, race, sexuality and anything. When people ask for equality or uh, they're not asking, they're asking for a, a space in the room. Anyone that opposes equality wants to completely remove you. You know, if you're, it's not how it came out before. <laughs> if, if, if we're trying to, to, if we're asking for equality, we're just asking for the same opportunity. Like I say, a seat at the table, a, a place in the room. We're not trying to replace anyone. We think that everyone can live. I'm not asking you with your opposing idea to be removed. I'm just asking to exist next to you. And mm. that's okay, because there's a, I can almost guarantee if you believe that my existence is wrong in the space that I'm in, I probably think that your existence is equally as wrong. However, I don't need you to be removed because I'm comfortable enough that everyone can, can live and choose to live as they want to live. When it came down to the, the armband, that's to protect people that oppose that view. I disagree, because then you are alienating people and women or... Um, anyone involved in the LGBTQ plus community. So to me, it, it makes perfect sense to allow everyone to exist in the same room with mm -hmm. differing opinions. However, they, they try and, yeah, I think if we're trying to silence people, or remove them from the equation, then we're running scared. And I'm telling you now, if I was at the Men's World Cup when they were threatening to card players and ban players, I would have served a ban and I wouldn't have played a game because there's no way I wouldn't have worn that armband onto the pitch in that moment. Uh, I say that from the comfort of this <laughs> chair, but I like to believe that's what I would have done because I think it's right and I think it represents the community that we, that we serve by playing football. Mm -hmm. And do you think that that mentality about wanting everyone to be equally included within the same space and, and not removing anyone from it, it is a similar thing that was applied when um, you were a big advocate for getting the, the whole um, football for girls and PE um, and part of that, that process to, to get the governmental financial aid and support. Yeah. Do you think that that's a, bit, a big part of that too and, and how does it feel to have played an active role in, in actually achieving that? Yeah, 100%. It's the same conversation. Uh, the world is big enough and we have enough hours in the day for everybody to do what they want to do. Uh, it's just a matter of putting it on. We have the facilities, or you know, maybe we don't, but when we create the facilities, we still have girls fighting, still get kicked off of pitches or girls team applying alongside the boys team. The boys team also be favored. But in schools, uh, the, the change that was made, yeah, I just don't think that we should be choosing for anyone how they, what they, what they want to do. Yeah, don't remove the choice for them. Let them choose, let them have the opportunity and, for us to have been, like I, as I've said this before, when we, when we go into a tournament, we always sit down and do our, uh, our goals. You know, what, what do we want to achieve? Normally win comes up, obviously, <laughs> but always legacy. It's always a conversation around legacy because as female footballers, we've always had to fight for that and we fight for ourselves, but we, we realize that we can affect so much more of society as well. And we kind of left it because we knew that the biggest change we could make would be to win. It was in our, it was in England. We had the chance to affect the most people. And it was literally before the final that conversation started. And for Lotta to, Lotta Wubamoy, incredible person, um, for her to have suggested it for everyone. I think it took about 30 seconds on the bus, uh, on the way home from Trafalgar Square, like as soon as we'd finished to say, this is what we're doing, is everybody on board? Uh, and that makes me so proud and you know i mentioned it before that oh of course i'm i'm delighted that we won <laughs> and that sounds so lackluster but my medal doesn't you know it's i don't look at it every day i don't it's just something that happened once and i'm so happy that i got to experience that and be there that day but what i see on a daily basis the change that i see the i go to a school and or even just driving home and i see girls out in the park playing football and i just 
yeah, to have been a part of this generation. And you know, if I was born 15 years later, I'd be rich and I'd be so rich <laughs> that I'd be living, I don't know, wherever I'd be living, I probably wouldn't even be a footballer. I'd probably pack it in at 27 when it all got too much. Um, but you know, if you, for me to have experienced both sides and be part of a generation that I saw my teammates work two jobs and luckily the year I left school that we weren't, weren't professionals, that was never me. But I've seen it from both sides and I've seen the change now. And to have been involved in this generation of footballers, I would take that over, over being rich. <laughs> <laughs>